All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another Mortgage Coach interview. It is August 5th, and a very exciting week. Uh, very exciting two weeks, especially if you're in mortgage and real estate. For all you mortgage professionals, it looks like rates are going in the, in the right direction, and that's exciting. Of course, that's also exciting to real estate professionals. I am super pumped today. We're, we're literally in our settlement, and I've got one of America's top um, real estate professionals. He's been the number one realtor in America three times. What's up, Ken DeLeon? Hey, hey, great to be on the show. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. I remember we shared a stage a couple times. Um, I can't remember what year it was, but it was at the the Mastermind Summit in Vegas. Uh, do you remember what year you spoke there? I think about, it was a while ago, maybe like 2014 and 2015 and 2016. Like, uh, yeah. But it was pretty great sharing the stage with Tony Robbins. Came, I came out dancing, um, had a good old time. Change, yeah, you know, I was changing life up there. Well, there, there's a there's a number of things that made you very distinguished in my mind. I'm going to list those off, and then we're going to get into how you're embracing the NAR settlement and any advice you have to the industry. But so, first of all, guys, this guy lives and defines have fun playlists. Like if you would have seen him. You know, he was the number one realtor in America and he just came out and he could have been the number one entertainer in America. Um, at the time, I can't remember if you had overcome cancer, or car accident, all of the above. But I mean, talk about a man who's overcome adversity. I mean, it was just like next level. Um, also, you were you were one of the first people in real estate where I'm like, this guy is a data driven Dude, like he had built up some, some proprietary data in Silicon Valley, one of the, you know, most affluent, um, high end real estate America in America. And and he had really built a unique competitive advantage. Like he had data and insights on neighborhoods that that no one else had. Do you still have that, by the way? I do indeed. I, I put, put a lot of effort into that. I have a data scientist I've worked with trying to predict the best deals and the best analytics. Um, so no, it's a, uh, I think everywhere, but particularly in Silicon Valley, my ability to kind of predict which markets will see the greatest amount of appreciation, um, kind of uh, analyze the market at a deeper level through the proprietary data, it really helps separate me. Everyone in Silicon Valley is data driven, but I think as a whole, affluent buyers everywhere, there's so much volatility in this market. If you can just, you know, back up your, all your arguments, why this is the best investment you'll make with data, with trends, um, it's much more convincing. Yeah, and that that very much distinguished you. Also, he was a real businessman. He came into the space and said, "You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna build out staff. I'm gonna build out team. I'm gonna spend a lot of money on marketing, so that when he showed up for a listing, it's like I've got data. I'm gonna really market your home. Look at this process that I have. Look at this team that I have. And I think the last time I interviewed you on our YouTube channel, you were either just rolling out a concierge program, but you'd also really delivered like if I lived in the market you served, it's like, hey, I want to be in the De Leon club. You know, like, like it was like, I want to be in that club. Is that still in action? Oh, more, more than ever, Dave, where um, you had to be part of the De Leon club. You're treated like a VIP. But really, our goal is that any question you have about residential real estate, we can address on the team. Big picture, why did I leave? If I was a very successful lawyer, why did I leave that for real estate? Anything you do one to three times in your life, buy a home, build a home. If you only do that one or three times in your life, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It's really not worth your time to become expert in everything. So as a result of that, the value of a good agent or mortgage lender can really be more powerful there than almost anywhere else. But along those lines, I thought about housing, the most important investment people can make. But so many questions, so many uncertainties. Why don't I build a team around the client where any question they have, we can help them with the experts' insights. Um, so I have a lot of lost leaders where these people are on salary. They are not generating money explicitly, but indirectly by providing things that nobody else is providing. For example, we have a vice president of development on staff. He has a master's from Stanford in construction management. He used to build $30 million homes. So if we have clients who are looking to you know, either build their dream home or remodel a home that was once great, but has fallen disrepair, he can come in there, kind of analyze it, see if it's a good investment or not. Is this a good project? Any impediments to construction? and then recommends the, the best contractor, the best architect, and helps shepherd them through the whole process and negotiating for them. Um, big picture, if you look at who your clients are, 
what are the problems and try and solve them, they're going to love you. So I view kind of a long-term relationship with my clients where I'm addressing anything that they could have. We have attorneys on staff addressing our legal needs. We have interior designers on staff, help them out with design. So more or less, um, I have everyone else is an independent contractor in real estate. Coming from an elite law firm, I love that. I think a team of salary specialists, a specialist where all they do is this thing, they can provide more expertise to that client. So rather than one agent, jack of all trades, master of none, trying to do everything, I have a team approach. And while I offer a lot of insights, um, I think my team offers even more. Um, so kind of taking a step back, being a sense of if I was the client, what would I want to have offered? And then create that system. So in Silicon Valley, everyone's very analytical. Let me create the data give them the analysis that makes them feel comfortable. Silicon Valley, everyone's too busy. Their time is more valuable than their money. Let me save them time by kind of solving their problems with remodeling, helping them get the good value. Um, you know, I do a lot of predictive analytics. How do you get a good deal? I explain um, data different approach, ways to do it. Um, so I think that I'm kind of really trying to encompass the full spectrum of the whole real estate transaction, not just one sale, but a long-term, um, you know, true relationship where I'm partnering with the client and helping them out. And the, the reality is I do make less per transaction because of I provide so much services. But this year, we're going to do over a billion dollars. Our business continues to grow. So I'd rather our margins are a little thinner per transaction, but clients love us. They're raving about us and we're getting more referrals. And I think we have a large fixed cost, but the extra volume is just pure profit. So I think our model um, and I think as we go forward, maybe talking about the future of the post our settlement. I think it's going to be more competitive out there for agents and you really need to provide value to separate yourself. Yeah. Let's, let's go with that. Like, like what are some of your predictions? Let's, let's ask a couple of questions, but then feel free to just kind of flow with, I think blank. Uh, like I, I think there's going to be more open houses. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to how, what percentage of buyers are making an offer blind and not knowing whether the seller is gonna is gonna um, pay for the for the buyer's agent's commission. Those are, I guess, two questions. And then let's just roll with how how do you see where do you see the puck going, and how do you think things will unfold? So, um, your big picture. This is a radical transformation. We've had the same business model since 1910 of the seller paying the buyer's agent commission. So, I think there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety amongst agents over. What does the future hold? And I think you want to divide it into um, our, our firm. We actually specialize where I focus really almost entirely on buyers. Um, and then my CEO, I own the company, but my CEO focuses on listings. I think buyers agents in particular need to really step up add a lot more value. Um, I think the simple reality, just to be candid, I think the simple reality is most agents were, you know, oftentimes on the buy side overpaid a little bit where, you know, maybe the client found the home and then the agent just ran out the contract. I think those days of like the client finding the home and you're getting a full two and a half percent are going to end if we're making the buyer sign a check out of their own pocket. So I think the key is on the buy side, I'm really, again, taking another step back, thinking about what do buyers want? Because if I'm going to, I'm decided that I'm going to ask for the top fee on the buy side commission. I don't want to discount my fee at all. But what I, in exchange for that, I need to provide a lot of great services to buyers so they feel that they're getting something in return. So I think that you really need to, you really need to kind of think about if you're a buyer's agent, how are you, you know, I just, last week I sold a home for 25 million. I'm going to make 2% or half a million dollars. How do I justify getting a half a million dollar check? Um, and then the key is, I think, solving the client's problems, proprietary software to kind of identify the best values actively searching for homes that um, are not available. But I think as a whole, people, buyers really need to up their game, buyers agents need to up their game. One thing I'm gonna start doing is looking at, um, I think right now real estate is too transactional. You buy a home and then whether it goes up or whether it goes down, when you go to sell it, um, the, um, the agent's gonna expect the same amount of commission, whether the home doubled or whether it dropped 50%. One thing I'm going to start doing is I want to align incentives. I want to be a partner with my clients. So how do I do that? I'm going to say that if they buy the home with us and as long as they hold it for over two years, that that home is going to be worth at least what they paid for it, if not more. And then, so if they buy a home for $5 million, they own it for over two years and they sell it, they have to use my firm. Um, they used to sell it. 
then what I'm going to say is that we're going to predict that you're going to make money. You're going to sell for more than you did. But if you don't make money, we're not going to make money. What I'm going to start doing is saying that if you bought for $5 million, we made our 2.5%, and then you sell it for $4.9 million with us, um, that $100,000 drop in price, I'm going to claw back some of my original 2.5% commission and give that back to you. What I'll do is I'm going to, on our listing side, we charge 3%. So there'll be more money coming in. But that 3% commission is going to get reduced by the, the drop up to the full amount that um, the amount of um, commission I initially got. So why am I doing something so radical? For one, I know the market so well. I'm very comfortable with the Silicon Valley market. When our market goes down, people choose not to sell. So it kind of self-regulates. So prices don't really drop. In my 23-year career, there's only been two instances, late 90s and then 2008, um, where we've had um, Silicon Valley drop for over 18 months. So I believe in this market. I also believe in my ability to find clients, um, put them in the homes with the most appreciation potential. And also in the areas we serve, um, I'm going to be, you know, those are the areas that have the greatest appreciation by my analysis. So I'm comfortable with this risk I'm taking um, because I will be getting a lot of money um, on the listing side. But also, most importantly, I don't feel I feel that with my expertise in picking the properties, coupled with knowing the market, it's not going to drop. And if it does, my clients will probably not sell. Um, so I'm comfortable with that. But that's just an example of arguably I might be America's top buyer's agent where say I'm a top 10 agent overall I'll do a billion dollars this year. But I think I'm the only top agent who focuses just on buyers. So um, but I just I know this market so well. Let me give clients the confidence to say, hey, I could just tell them this is going to be a good investment. But if I'm willing to explicitly be their partner, align my interest with theirs, it's such a more powerful goal. Um, so I'm trying to find ways to really add value because I'm going to charge top dollar on the buy side. But I actually think even though overall commissions on the buy side are predicted to decline, I think that for top agents, they might go up. Um, the reason being is now buyers, they're having to do more scrutiny about, whoa, you're actually, this isn't free. I might have to pay money. Let me, if I'm going to pay money, let me work with the best because too often they would pick a buyer's agent. They don't really think about it as any cost or money. I'm going to pick. Um, this one, my son, um, you know, that guy on the soccer team with my same son, he's an agent. Let me use him. But I think that's going to fade away. People are going to give a lot more forethought. If they're paying six figures in Silicon Valley to work with somebody, they're going to vet that person. So I'm excited for this. I also think listing agent commissions might go up um, because um, I think you're going to see listing agents maybe doing more often than not having to, you know, if the buyers don't want to work with their own buyer's agents, maybe they approach the listing agent directly. So I think listing agent commissions will stay the same or arguably go up. And but on the buy side, I think if you're an agent, you really need to up your game. If you're a mortgage lender, like the majority of people on this call, I think if you could partner with your agents, how can you know if ever I have mortgage people say, Ken, I think I can grow your business and help you with this. I have this database. Do you want to do any shared marketing together? Uh, but on the mortgage side, if you can bring value to the buyer's agents, that's going to be a separator because I think the buyer's agents are going to have to step up. There'll be less money they'll be getting if they're not good. And then consequently, the value of you as a lender, giving them some leads or some insights will, I think, grow in value. So let me tell you a few things I'm hearing top mortgage coaches, people in our community do that realtors are lacking. And I'd love to know your impressions on this. And then also any other things that you think lenders should do is, is one, confused buyers don't 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 win the offer and most offer most you know homes that are well priced are still in multiple offer situations so we teach that like hey your job is a mortgage professional yes close on time close clean close smooth but going forward get that consumer really excited about buying right now in this market and have a process that's going to help them win in a multiple offer situation and so part of that process that we teach, I see you nodding your head, like that's it, that's a good value prop that for a lender to have. Uh, and then and then you know we say, hey, you're gonna have to get them comfortable around the the commission, you know, the buyer's agent commission. So maybe like column A is the seller pays it, just like they always have. Column B is maybe, you know, you're gonna have to put less down and finance it. Column three is, hey, we could build it into the purchase price. And, you know, and then column four, and I'm not saying it would always be these four columns. Column four is you're just paying for it. But 
get them unconfused that like, hey, you can buy this house regardless of whether the seller pays them. And here's some strategies. Any thoughts on that? Dave, I think that's brilliant where really what we're doing, both the agent and the mortgage um, affiliate, they're educating the client where I think what we want to do is we want to get the client both excited, but also confident as well. And if I have a mortgage lender that whenever I send clients to them, they're, they're very comfortable being non-contingent because the mortgage lender is like, no, we got this. It's not a problem at all. Ken's a great agent. Um, in this market, I think you generally need to be non-contingent to be competitive. So I recommend that. Um, but I'll have some loan officers who I have worked with before, like, you need a contingency to feel protected. And like in our market, Silicon Valley, which is quite heated below 10 million, you really to have a contingency is a bit of a dead on arrival. So if I can, we want to create, it's really you're, you're forming a partnership where the agents and the lender together are kind of pumping up the client, giving them excitement for the deal. Why? And I do feel it's a good time to buy. Once rates go down further, prices will, you know, it's hard not to imagine them going up. Um, giving them confidence and also preparing them for the market, knowing market conditions. Well, I'll tell clients are generally in Silicon Valley, most winning offers, about 85 to 90 percent of winning offers are non-contingent. Now, maybe maybe a third of offers do have contingencies, but those offers are not winning offers generally. So that's why the percentage is so much lower and just kind of getting people to expect that the norm is great terms. And then I think a strong lender as a partner for the agent, you're really preparing the client because. If rates do go down, there's obviously volatility in the stock market today in the last few weeks. But generally, that's going to be good for rates. Rates should go down. Generally, the silver lining to the volatility in the stock market, I want to invest in housing. So I'm actually pretty hopeful 2025 is going to be a good year. I think there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in real estate in regards to on the lending side rates. But I feel pretty good about that in light of recent events. And then um, agents are more concerned where I think uh, we will probably see some attrition among the agent ranks. Um, so I think if um, if anyone, you know, the value of referrals or value of helping out your agent is probably going to be higher than ever before. Yeah, no, no doubt. Another uh, tactic that mortgage coaches are doing is that when you, you know, people are like, rates are still high, relatively speaking. When they show them what they qualify for, they're showing today's rates. And then they're showing, and this is what a refi looks like. So that client can, you know, like, hey, date the rate, marry the house. They can visualize the future. And then the other thing is showing the net worth growth. So, you know, let's, oh. let's see what you think the appreciation rate is, especially with you, you have a lot of data on what the appreciation yeah, exactly. has likely been. And then to put that into the prequal performa and show what the house might look like in three years. So it's like, Hey, you're buying it now for this. Some point we're going to be able to refinance it and look at your net worth. If things appreciate at 3%. Um, I think that checks all the boxes. Like it gets them super excited about buying in this market. And so from your perspective, are those the kinds of things that lenders need to do to support agents going forward? That would be great where um, it, I understand buyers, there is a lot of trepidation in the market right now, I think because of the volatility. So I think in many ways we need to kind of instill um and still the why this is a good investment. I left law for real estate because I found there's no better way to make money than through a successful purchase or primary residence. This is still, still the best investment clients can make, but we need to articulate that, show them to that. So I love the idea of having the analytics where you can say, you know, because rental, you're just throwing the money away, but look at your net worth in the next three years if you just hold on. So I think that's wise. And also, as you're saying, that number, like at that 6.75, like that's a big number. But like, oh, in three years, it could be 4% and how much lower that is. And letting people see the future just because this is a hard, unique environment for rates. But I think it's it maybe we don't get back to two and a half percent, but getting back to four to five percent and then not too far seems maybe feasible. So I think all these huge numbers, if you can like, yeah, you're paying a lot now. But as you're saying, date the rate, marry the home in two years, you'll be so happy that when you refinance, and we bring costs down. So I think that's very wise. Yeah, I, I actually had dinner with Phil Jones. I don't know if you know the author of exactly what to say, but anyone listening, you, you should read this book if you haven't. Um, nice. But he, he he was saying, and he speaks with Tom Ferry all the time. He's you know sold over 2 million copies of this book. But he was saying that real estate agents need to start playing the five-year game and you need to vision cast. You know, we're buying it today. This is what five-year looks like. And then he's going to love your idea. You're actually like, you're you're closing two deals. You know, like, hey, I'm going to list your home now. This is what I'm going to do in two years. 
he would probably tell you like, Hey, what's your five-year promise? You know, like, like what's the five-year promise, but let's, let's, let's not be so transactional. Let's focus on that. So here's another question I would love for you to know, since you and I talked last, I co-founded a nonprofit called First Home IQ that is really dedicated to financial literacy and homeowner readiness for Gen Z. So it's it's all about like, let's lean in to 20 year olds um, and provide them financial literacy around buying your first home as young and fast as you can. And so one of the things that we're seeing in our community is where mortgage professionals are going to families who have lots of equity. There's 300 trillion in equity in America and, and home ownership is hard. And let's lean into the family with, Hey, what's your plan for your kids? And I've got ideas and strategies to help your kids get into home ownership in their twenties. Well, any, any thoughts on um, being a little more proactive with families and helping them with home ownership planning for, for their kids in the twenties. And I think that's brilliant. Yes, no, a great, great questions all around. So for one, I think it's brilliant where, you know, you and I know that real estate is the best investment you can make, but far too often people start too late. They don't transact enough. Um, I look at myself, I had a period where every two years I'd buy the total fixture upper that my clients went by. I would move in myself, live in it as is. And then when I moved out after two years, fix it up and sell it for a good profit. And I had four kids, five kids now. And I would just tell, this is how daddy buys your toys. But I had a four year, um, four homes over 10 years where I took a $350,000 down payment and made 7 million, um, 7 million in profit, like one and a half million per home. Um, buy, you know, first home I bought it for 1.2 million, sold it for 2.65, two and a half years later, that type of thing. But like I left, like this is the best way to make money. But the, I, every two years you should use it, but people don't. But especially you get people with young before they have children and they can have that velocity of speed and moving. I mean, they don't have to sell after two years, but they they live in it for two years. And then they have another, you know, still your primary residence. You were there for two of the last five, rent it out for another two, and then you sell it. But like you keep it going because this giveaway, which really nowhere else can you get a half a million dollar capital gains exemption. People use it once in their life. Use it as many times as you can early and often. Um, and along those lines, education is key where we need to, you know, advocate and educate our clients that this is the best investment they can make. I love what you're doing. Dave, maybe we should collaborate. Um, very soon, I'm going to have coming out realestateprofessor.com. Realestateprofessor.com. It's just all these articles, all these videos I've written about how to, you know, buying a home, how to, how do you get the best deal, what to look for, seasonality in the market, like all this kind of nuanced analysis. And my thoughts are that I'm a little worried about people are going to use buyer's agents less in light of that they might have to write, you know, their own check to pay for the buyer's agents. So that consumers are not left behind. I think if we can have these great, educational resources, which actually highlight the value of a good agent. Um, but I think I'm really going to, that real estate professor is going to launch soon. Um, and I just, as a whole, it's going to be non-commercial. It's just educational, um, really to kind of help people out because um, it's the best investment you can make, but so much ignorance pervades that people aren't optimizing the process. And everyone here on this call, we've given so much time in our life to like thinking about real estate and how to you know maximize, optimize. So let's share that. That's the best knowledge is the greatest gift you can give. And don't look for profit. I think on so many things, just give and give. And then it comes back to you in in indirect ways. But um, that's, I love what you're doing and I'm seeking to follow up as well. Yeah, well, I will definitely introduce you to Kristen Messerly who runs First Home IQ. And we would love to have some of your content in that platform. And we would love to, to market that. We really, we have, my thesis is loan officers and realtors can be the first responders to the financial literacy crisis in America. Because there is truly a financial literacy crisis in America. And, and by, you know, just, just that strategy you, you, you shared, like, hey, I bought a house every two years, fixed it up. I mean, every real estate in America, agent in America should be following that. Um, my son, who just graduated from college, has decided he's going to pursue a career in real estate. And I'm like, hey, mm -hmm. when, when change is happening, uh, the, no better time. You don't have any bad habits. You don't have any um, legacy expectations. And if you are one of the top 1% in real estate, you're going to kill it. Um, yeah, what advice fair. do you have someone, what advice do you have for someone getting into real estate right now in their twenties or thirties? 
besides go to work for you. Besides go to work for you. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, I would say first and foremost, really kind of, again, taking a step back and thinking about from their personal level, what do they feel is missing in the marketplace where when I looked at like, what do I offer? I offer all this data analysis. I offer like help with remodeling. I offer legal analysis. But when I was buying my first home in Palo Alto 25 years ago, when I was still an attorney, not yet an agent, I was like, why does it, you know, I need help with this. Why isn't anyone providing this? So I think kind of try to identify what you from, because like attracts like. So if you can find people who are like you, find what's missing in the marketplace from your, from your perspective, find what's missing and then fill that void. So, okay, nobody's providing insights on how to remodel. I'm going to bring in a guy who all he does is help clients remodel. No one's, everyone's doing the firm handshake, but no one's really providing any analysis. So let me give them a lot of data and analysis and go deeper on things. Um, so kind of separate yourself. There are, you know, so many agents out there. I think in this world of um, buyer's agent commissions likely declining, we're going to see attrition. But I think, as we said earlier, I think the top people are going to thrive because it's put a spotlight on if I'm paying this much money, what's the value? And if you're truly providing value, then I think you're going to thrive. And you look at the internet, it was supposed to be the death of the middleman. But if the middleman is providing more value than they're charging, the middleman is going to thrive. So I think the key is try to think about what they would want in the marketplace that's not there. How do they separate themselves? And how do they provide the most value to clients? Um, and then if you have that mindset, and then people always like, everyone, like I remember so many classes were about like how to get leads, how to get leads. Um, you know, would you pay referral fees to do this marketing? Like I just spent a lot of time becoming the best agent I could. I read all these books constantly. I got an MBA at Stanford recently. Um, so I'm just constantly trying to become a lifelong learner. And I think just be the best and then people will come to you, uh, but really try to provide value. Also, one other thing, don't worry about the money. Um, the irony is when you when you don't worry about the money, people just immediately trust you. And then when they trust you, the irony is the money comes. But I never worry about, I only recommend a client buy something if I buy it with my own money. I'm never looking for the short-term deal. I always have the long, long, long run view. You're a fiduciary, you're protecting your, your client's interests are ahead of your own. Protect the client at all costs. They sense that and they're going to get a thousand referrals from them. Don't focus on the short term. Have that five-year horizon. So many agents, they've been doing it for 30 years, but they've been doing the same year 30 times. Constantly keep on growing. I constantly grow my practice. Change it. That was absolutely incredible advice. Thank you so much for that. Uh, What about open houses? Are there going to be more open houses? Are there going to be more buyers before they sign a commitment that you know they're they're going you know there's gonna be more buyers going to open houses there's gonna to put that to put more intention around that any any thoughts no great great question dave it's kind of like going back to college where you know i wanted to like meet some women but i didn't necessarily want to like be exclusive to a woman too early um right so i I think the open houses are really going to become the platform and how homes are going to sell themselves where um we're on my team, we're thinking that we might have a short little, because if someone meets you for the first time, they haven't seen you in action, it's a big commitment to say, pay me two and a half percent no matter what you buy. So we're going to have something like, hey, we'll we'll work with you for like a week, see what you think of us, and then, you know, hopefully we'll dazzle you, then you'll sign it. Um, but I think we really need to kind of separate, like show the value add, um, be unique. But I think um, a lot of people are going to be leery of signing these. So open houses will become key. And um I think that we're going to, we, we do a huge amount of marketing for open houses. I think marketing might become more direct where like we're directly marketing directly to buyers kind of, you know, I think the newspaper ads will probably fade because those are more for sellers to get listings. Like if, if you go to the seller being like, I'm marketing directly to buyers, um, I'm going to have like at our open houses, we'll spend like, you know, our first week on the market, we'll spend like 20 K in marketing, wow. but my business model, um, uh, my Dave, my business model in six words, blow in. Blow up, blow out. Um, where about 85% of our listings sell in one week. We only take listings that are competitively priced. Ideally, uh, most of our listings get multiple offers. Most of our listings, if they sell in the first week, on average, they sell for 14.4% above list price. Um, so we just come in, we offer the most of anybody, but we almost we, we we walk away from about one out of three listings we could get because we need people to follow our model, which is underpriced, crazy marketing, multiple offers, move on. Um, and that's actually in other parts of the country, being on the market for a year might be the way you get the best price in Silicon Valley below 8 million. You get the best price by, you know, auction dynamic, multiple offers, counters going, you know, getting, we've had some listings sell for more than 2 million above list price. Um, so 
Um, but that's where um, that's where a lot of kind of things are. Um, understand your market, understand what you offer. Uh, but no, we're um, we're kind of going. We're excited for this change. Um, we think actually, as you kind of said, when there's change, this is a great opportunity. We think our market share is going to grow. We're everyone's cutting back on marketing. We're stepping up on marketing um, because I think this is the August seventeenth, just a few weeks away. Um, this is where things are going to change, and I think our firm is poised to succeed because we've been this whole year. We predicted in October that this court case would come out as it did. Um, you know, myself, my CEO, or both attorneys. People were shocked that this Missouri case had nationwide ramifications. We weren't. We've been playing on this for a year. Um, we have everything ready to launch, so um, we're excited. But I think the key is agents need to educate more, open house more, provide more value, and like realize that like if you're going to get someone to sign a check, make sure that you're offering the value you should. This has been incredible. I would love to interview you again after, maybe a couple of weeks oh, or a month afterwards, and just hear how things are shaking out. Um you know, let's my, let's make this my final question. But like, you're speaking to mortgage professionals, and my goal always when I you know the YouTube channel is built on creating value. You know, like like how can my advice make a difference? One, it's interviewing people like you, and then creating value, and that's my whole strategy with our YouTube channel. Just be the most valuable YouTube channel for a loan officer that wants to be an advisor. Like you, you got to want to be an advisor. If you want to have just the lowest rate and be a salesperson, you know, that's cool. Yeah. Just not, that's not who we run with. So with that said, the people listening want to be valuable to agents. Any closing thoughts? Like if you, you're just talking to people that are advisors and they just want to be valuable to agents right now at this time, any closing thoughts for them? Perfect. Um, I'll start with kind of analogy. The way I, I wanted to kind of build my business was I said, let me study who my clients are and then really analyze them and what are the greatest needs and then try to solve for those needs. So if you could have a lender who could actually kind of take that approach where the client really is the agent and then they could go like, Ken, I've studied your business and it looks like you do a crazy amount of volume, but you have, you know, some weekends you have like 15 open houses. You probably need some, you know, some open house help or let me see, I can help you with this way. I can provide you know, shared marketing and provide some food, I can show up at one of these and collect names for you. But if someone could actually analyze that individual, hey, um, Frank, you're a rising star, but you haven't quite launched yet, but I think you provide a lot of talent. Can we co-market and that's going to grow your market share? And then we're going to ride this, you know, as your career progresses, I look forward to being your primary lender, but let me help you launch. But if you could have somebody who like, don't just like always offer the same thing to the agent, try to take into account who they are, what the problems are. You don't have to spend an hour, but Think of five minutes of like who this agent is, what their issues are. And if you come to them with forethought that you've actually studied them, even if I do like, oh, I'm not, I thought about that, but I didn't do that for this reason, I'll still appreciate they took the time and then I'll be more open to it. Um, and then also that's one route. Another route with clients, I always try to give before I take, um, like at open houses, maybe we'll serve lattes or food or things like that. But I find that if there's a little bit of something in it for the client, they're much more open to giving me their contact information and wanting to work with me. So I think I don't always immediately expect that my first give is going to get me something in return. So I think also like give back, give to the agents as much as you can, but also the more you build, the agents going to be like, wow, this person sent me two referrals. I really should talk to them. So I think um, just kind of consistently trying to think about, as you kind of said, how can I add value? Um, and then like the idea of like your platform where lenders on your, on, you know, using your platform are educating the client, that clients can be more confident to come in on contingent probably more confident on the housing market because they've run the analytics through your software and they realize in three years, their home's going to make them a lot more money. So I think those lines where you're the shared mission of helping the client become more confident, ready to best poise to put in a competitive offer. So that teamwork aspect is great. So I'd say three things. One is kind of um, differentiating yourself. Number two is adding value where you try to tailor it, um, that addition to who the cl client is. And then number three, kind of educating the client to be, um, shared education to be the best they can be. But those three things would make somebody very valuable to me. And once I have that person, I want to stick with them. Pure gold, Ken. Although you may, I have to ask you one more question because you you mentioned about, I always like to give at open houses and you made it clear. And I know you're collecting data. You know, you're collecting data on neighbors and everybody that's coming through it. 
just give me what what is a Ken De Leon open house? Are you serving lattes at those? Like, what are all the yeah, things so, that you do in an open house? So, David, a Ken De Leon open house, it's like a sober party. And maybe the sober part, sometimes that's debatable. Sip a little champagne <laughs> back out. <laughs> uh, but kidding, like, to me, I just want to make life exciting and then, like, housing exciting. And I think the more, like, embraced and excited people are, the more they're going to, like, want to buy it. So, yeah, so, no, our open houses, we give a lot of thought to it, where um, a good open house with a good backyard will have a latte cart serving espressos. Um, there was a Harvard um, study that showed that when people have something warm in their hand, they're more open to new ideas. Oh, well, maybe I should buy this house. And they're just more trusting. Um, so kind of um, doing that, whether it's food or lattes, um, making the house look beautiful. We have, um, I provide free staging. So um, we charge, our commission is more than others on the listing side, but we also provide more, um, including staging. But the home looks spectacular, um, spotless. Um, to me, it's insulting if a home doesn't look good to a buyer, and I think they feel it. Um, when the kids come in, we'll have little things for them. Sometimes it's a toy, a little teddy bear. But you keep the kids entertained. The parents stay longer. Um, the parents are thankful that you gave their kids something, and they're enjoying the house. Um, so we really try to think about and just, like, bring the energy. Hey, how are you? Ken De Leon, damn glad to meet you. Uh, but uh, but just kind of, like, bringing the power and, like, this is a party. I'm the host of the party. We had music playing. Maybe I'm kind of, like, just kind of swaying in the background, doing a little dance. Uh, but just making them fun where like I'll have people like they'll be like four years later, I met you in an open house. I've never forgotten it. So like just be that unforgettable person. Like and then, you know, when someone comes in, I always remember their write their names down and then they're going through it. I'm like, oh, Frank and Susan, what was your favorite part of the home? Or wasn't that part amazing, Joe? Uh, but like, oh, you remembered my name. So like people just like make people feel special, make the event feel special. And then that energy permeates through everything and they want to work with you or they want to buy the house. They don't even know why. Dude, you you have given so much gold, Ken. One last little, I would love to hear your script on this. So, because I hear different agents ask for the name differently, like, oh, the seller is requiring everybody to fill in the form. Uh, how do you ask for the name and number when you're working at an open house? Or how do you train your team to do that? Yeah, exactly. Great question. So you know, sometimes you'll see someone like, my gosh, how did that, that open house only had 15 people through? How did they get 12 names and numbers? Um, because they like, kind of forced that person to write it down, maybe didn't want to. Of the 12, maybe like over half were fake or not real. So what I try to do is instead, to me, everything about life should be voluntary and exciting. So generally, I'll only, at an open house, I'll probably only pick up like three names, but all three names will want to work with me. So so I'm about high yield. So I only, I'll, I'll engage with a lot of people, but to ask for their phone number, I'll want to have like something clicked. I was able to give them some sort of insights um, we met, you know, it was just a good feeling. And then I'll say, oh, actually, I have a lot. And then again, kind of along those lines, try to add value. Oh, actually, I know you didn't like this home, but I have a list of um, our upcoming listings. We have two that are like that. May I send that to you? Oh, you seem to like this home. I've actually reviewed the disclosures. I've summarized them for you to save you some time. May I send that to you? Um, so I'm always trying to, how can I, oh, I actually wrote a great article about how to get a home below market value. I hired a data scientist to study this. Can I send you this article to help you get a home for the best deal possible? Like, so I'll have like all these articles or insights I can give clients. And when you're giving them something of value, they're more than like, oh yeah, that's great. Here's my email. So not like I'm forcing you to do this. The seller, like the seller needs to know, like everyone knows that's a lie. So like, no, I'm giving you something of value. And then through that, you're like, I want to work with this person. So to me, everything is about value proposition, being higher than anyone else, truly caring for the clients and then asking when the time is right. But then you've already built that bond by the time you ask where they're like more than happy to it to give you that and excited to work with you. I love it. And I bet you follow up with everybody that you engage with. Oh, you know? I have an email addiction. Yeah, no, I, I'm super, you know, super responsive. So Ken, I so appreciate it. If people are going to follow you, what are the best channels to follow you? And you mentioned something about the real estate professor or something. What, you know, how yeah, can people real follow and be in the know? Yeah, exactly. So realestateprofessor.com, that's probably coming out in like a month or two. So still building content for that, but that will be out there. Um, KenDeLeon.com has um, some of my kind of like public speaking or some of my thoughts. And then DeLeon Realty is over at social media, D-E-L-E-O-N, um, where we're on Instagram, you know, all the all the usuals. Um, Dude, I so appreciate the time. Thank you so much for leaning back into this community. And it just seems like you've just continued to to thrive. So congrats on everything that you've accomplished and can't wait to keep this conversation going, my man. 
Thank you, Dave. And also I want to compliment you. Like you're very focused on educating, educate, you know, giving people the tools to educate the client to add value. To me, that's such a higher level of real estate than like, uh, here's my rate. It's the lowest around. No, like here's the, all my analysis and why you should pick this. And this program is probably best for your goals. Like really like take care of the clients, not transactional, but like long-term best interest. That's the way you add value. That's the way you get a client for life. That's the way you can feel good going to bed at night that you're adding more value than you're taking. So, so yeah, uh, no, applause to yeah, you we'll, and to everyone to use your platform. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And it just makes the job a lot more fun. I mean, whether you're in mortgage exactly. or real estate, feels good. So beyond the transaction, uh, the, the job is a lot more fun. The value is a lot more transformational. If you have not already followed us on YouTube, make sure you subscribe right now. Also, make sure you're following savageinsights.com. All my best content, I can assure you, this will be at the very top for a few weeks is there. And whatever I'm doing next is at savageinsights.com. Take care, everybody.